for me, I think this project was was really important. Uh, first of all, because it it sort of fits in with the library and the university sort of. Uh, strategic plan around diversity, equity, and inclusion, of course, uh, but also because we really wanted to uh, create a project that really helped celebrate the center's 50th anniversary and really tell the story of the people who have who have been a part of the center and the community that it's built here on campus and in Southeast Michigan more broadly. And I think, you know, it was also important for us to celebrate these stories and to uplift these voices that are often marginalized and on the fringe. And so I think that was a really core factor for us is not only to sort of create a project that can celebrate the history, but also to to share these wonderful and amazing stories of community um, here at Ann Arbor and more broadly speaking, since, you know, the project sort of spilled over into multiple states. Um, but I think for me personally, uh, <clears throat> being situated in the library, I think it it shows the importance of community archiving projects, which I think is something that's uh, sort of a gap that we have in academic libraries. And I think that uh, this project really sort of highlights the need for sort of community archiving projects, especially around oral history um, that really sort of um, sort of uh, tell stories that aren't often heard in academia. Thank you. Um, Sergio, would you like to share anything with this question? Yeah, um, I think more than anything, it provides an opportunity to paint a picture of the way in which LGBTQ folks not only experience life, but also see life. And because we have been pushed to the extreme margins as LGBTQ people, like historically, I think that it's important to center projects like this because now it's the community speaking about the community, right? Rather than other people interpreting how we're experiencing life. Um, and one of the things that I told, especially Latino students, Latina students, Latinx students on campus, when I was working with La Casa is that we are living in a digital era and sometimes we forget that it's a lot easier to capture these stories and these narratives. So I think the fact that we're doing it currently as we're also living in a very divisive time in the nation um, is important rather than you know, being 20 years down the line and thinking we had an excellent opportunity, why didn't we take it? So I think the fact that you all have created this platform, have created this initiative, and that there is um, drive behind this project just says a lot about how it is that you're valuing these narratives and these stories, and also how we are positioning ourselves within a larger American cultural context, right, and historical context. So hopefully, um, as an oral historian myself, these narratives will help inform people of the experiences that we're going through, but also will inspire that next generation or those other folks that are interested in our stories that come and visit them. Because I think that we, they capture moments of, of clarity, but also moments of passion and moments of you know, being down. But um, I think that our, our stories generally inspire many people. So I think that that's really significant. Thank you. Mari, would you like to share anything about this question? Yeah, I just think there, you know, like the oral history tradition, you know, sort of an archiving practice sort of exists outside of that, right? People have been telling stories forever. And I think there's something really spiritually affirming and cementing about telling your story, about having a story to tell, like seeing yourself as a part of a history of something, I think as a queer person is really beautiful and I think connects us to the complicated, you know, sometimes amorphous energy that is LGBTQ experiences, that it like allows it to exist nebulously, but also for it to exist. Um, and I think that is really beautiful about this project. Um, yeah. Thank you. I, I share a lot of those sentiments. It feels like we're kind of leaning into these really old traditional ways of storytelling and the really natural way that we have shared our stories with other people, but also cementing it, archiving it, giving it the care that it deserves so it can be preserved properly, right? All right, I'm going to move on to our next question. So for those of us who have been interviewed for the Oral History Project, I would like you to tell us a little bit about what that experience was like. Um, and if you've conducted interviews before, you know, in your other previous work, what did it feel like to be on the other side? Sergio, would you like to start us off? Yeah, so um, yeah, I've, I've been doing, I started doing oral histories when I was an undergrad. Um, so I was not a stranger 
of a to asking questions. But I think that um, I've had certain opportunities where I also interview oral historians and then they turn it around to me and I become the one getting interviewed, um, you know, because I think that oral history is so personal um, that there, it needs to be more conversational than me asking all the questions. Like we need to mutually understand each other in order to see how the flow of conversation is gonna go. So I think when I do my oral histories, for example, I try to know a little bit more about the person before I actually go on and just ask like, well, I'm just interested in A, B, and C. And I felt like being on this side, it felt very conversational, um, which is something that I admire a lot. And it felt like I was treated with respect and dignity, which is not the case with every uh, interview or oral history that I've had. Many opportunities which I have turned down because just in the way that they communicate through email, is really alarming. And, and then how they tell you that they wanna use your stories. Cause um, I think that we also as queer people need to understand that sometimes most people uh, might find our, our stories to be exploitative, right? So they wanna do something else with our, our personal stories. And, and this did not feel like that. And I was very comfortable opening up um, to Leo about my experiences, not only because I knew them from, from the Prison Creative Arts Project, and worked with them, but also because there was a sense of familiarity that I think needs to be established when you do these oral history projects in order to get down to the meat. Otherwise, you're just going to get those sort of superficial yes, no, short answer questions. So it felt very conversational. I felt comfortable. And also, I might add, because a lot of the things that I spoke about in the oral history is things that I'm writing about in my dissertation about my journey coming out when I arrived to Michigan and then creating a sense of home between Latinx men on campus, it seemed like I was retelling a story now verbally instead of writing on it and just being in my head. So it gave me a good opportunity to go back in my writing and say, oh my God, I forgot that I actually experienced this. So it was beneficial. <laughs> That relationship between kind of the speaking and the writing, I found really interesting with the oral history um, project. Mari, would you like to share your experiences being interviewed? Yeah, it was so much fun. I had, it felt like a key, you know, I was key in. I think that as someone who works a lot with storytelling, you know, I think, um, you know, storytelling is so political. And what does it mean to tell these stories in an institution, right? Um, as someone who is an employee with the university, you know, who was formerly a student with the university, there are all of these different ways that we're sort of contending with these outside forces that impact how we tell our stories, right? And, 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 and it was freeing to tell our stories in this way, but also there was sort of a mindfulness and attention to the fact that we still exist in a transphobic, queerphobic, homophobic, um, racist context, right? Like that doesn't change. And so I think for me, it was really important that I, before I came to that space, had had those conversations with myself about what was I going to prioritize um, in telling my story. And I think that so much of queer oral history narratives have been rooted and connected to surviving, that like I wanted to prioritize being honest um, because I knew that this for me was not about those systems, right? Not even about straight folks or cis folks who may be interpreting or hearing these stories for the first time. I was speaking directly to queer community um, and I wanted to be honest um, in that. And so I think that in the, the experience for me was really freeing, but also had come after that sort of process. So I think I really prioritized being a human and centering humanity, but also talking really frankly about my experiences um, and my perspectives on what it means to be queer um, and trans in a university environment and in, the, in, in, in this community and the beautiful and also the, the sort of like complicated, sometimes ugly parts of that. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share a little bit too, as someone who did interviews for the project and then got to be interviewed by Leo and Parker. Um, I agree with those sentiments that I felt fortunate that I had relationships with the people interviewing me. I think that made a huge difference. It's not something we can always control, but in the times that we do have um, even shared identities to some extent, but it, um, especially these connections. Um, it, it totally made a difference in the interview. And for myself, I found it really interesting because I was still kind of going through my um, journey of coming to 
the senses of who I am and my queer identity and what that meant for me. Um, as I was working on this project, I, I wasn't out to um, a lot of my family and people back home when I took the job with Spectrum Center. And so um, really kind of you know, got comfortable as a queer person in this new setting and this new home for me and was kind of picking up all those pieces together as I was being interviewed and doing this work. So very interesting personal experience for myself. All right, I'm going to move on to the next question. So a couple people with us today are involved in performing arts. So I was wondering if some folks can talk to us a little bit about that connection between oral histories and storytelling through the arts and in what ways has it been relevant to your own artistic practice. Leo, would you like to start us off? Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Um, so Yes, context is that I'm not currently engaged in performing arts, but I was for a very long time. Um, I did theater for most of my life growing up and then also studied theater for two years here. Um, and a lot of that time, I was the only like trans person in my theater. Um, later on in high school, there were a few others who joined us, but even then it was very few. And so I think that um, for me, having space for these queer stories is a really important like starting place for that. Um, I think one experience that stood out to me as I was like thinking about this topic and thinking about these questions um, was an experience I had in high school working on a devised theater piece as a young person. So there were 13 of us working on this piece. Um, a lot of us were, were LGBTQ, four of us were trans and two of us decided to talk about it. Um, and so higher ups in administration within the organization were not really cool with that. Um, they thought it was not appropriate for the show. Um, and so our show got shut down about a week before it was set to open. Um, and I think that that experience of being silenced as not just like a queer person, but a queer person choosing to tell my story specifically um, was really hurtful, especially in you know space that is considered to be pretty queer friendly. Um, and so I think having spaces like the Oral History Project or spaces in the performing arts where these stories can be told, but also like celebrated by the people who have ownership over them takes back some of that power. Um, so kind of, upholding queer and trans stories, not as being inappropriate, but as being beautiful and complex and empowering and challenging um, and deserving of space to be witnessed. Um, so I'm not engaged in theater now, but my work with theater in the past and also my work with the Oral History Project now um, isn't necessarily a performance, but it's kind of that similar forum where these materials can be shared and used by the people whose stories they are. And so I think that's kind of the connection there for me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mari, would you like to share a little bit of your experience with that? Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Um, so much of the work that we do um, within ETC and that I've sort of been able to adopt into my own personal art practice comes from Theater of the Oppressed, um, which is a, 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 a theater methodology that came from Augusto Boal, who was a Brazilian theater artist and practitioner. Um, who sort of understood that stories are the ways that power is reinforced and also the ways in which power is disrupted and revolutions are built, right? And so, so much of storytelling is about understanding, so much of that work is about understanding what is the story? What are the stories of ourselves? What are the stories of our communities? Um, and who's telling that story? And, and Boal believed that theater was a rehearsal for revolution. And so, so much of that work is about seeing a story and feeling autonomous in that story to disrupt, to change, um, and to transform it. So I think oral history is so important because by hearing and engaging with all these stories, we start to understand what stories we tell about ourselves and about our world and, and feel empowered to change them. So that's... Thank you. Sergio, would you like to share anything about performing arts in this project? Yeah, um, I think I can I can provide a different take just because I so I grew up being a dancer. So music and dance to me have been the center of my identity, really. And 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 when I lost that aspect of myself, which I'm now refinding, I wasn't who I was. And and I think that in this interview, when I was speaking about particularly my experience performing. I, re I discovered that the reason why I was so happy with dance is because body, our bodies and choreography and, and movement carry history, right? Like there is a point of origin in which a certain hand gesture or movement or turn was created and there is some sort of cultural significance behind it. So even though I wasn't speaking about 
a history, I was moving through history, right? I was, I was moving history. Um, so I think realizing how my body can be in, connecti- in connection to these sort of ancestral movements and patterns of movement just made me much more Mexicano. It made me really connected to my Mexican identity. Um, and also, I think when I got to Michigan, I started working a lot with the Prison Creative Arts Project, um, going to Brazil and then having, um, you know, it, so obviously Portuguese is not my, my first language, but knew, I knew more Portuguese than the students that went. And then knowing that our bodies were communicating with each other, right, without really, with, even when we had a linguistic barrier or there wasn't really a lot of translation, that was extremely powerful. So thinking now about how our bodies are constantly performing and moving, but they're also an adaptation of all the different spaces and people that we encounter is really powerful to me um, as a dancer and as a practicing you know, performer in that sense. So the, the connection between oral histories, now I see it broadly because it's not just spoken word, it's how we dress, it's the intonation of our words and it's how we move, right? It's all of these other performative aspects that also carry history that I think are worthy of being acknowledged as well. Thank you. I got chills you talking about ancestral movement. (laughs) Um, Okay, so this next question is going to be for our professional staff. So one element of this project that we um, are really proud of is the fact that this was entirely led and run by undergraduate students. And we had prof staff supporting us through that project. So um, Mark and Andras, these questions, this is targeted at you. Uh, what is important about creating opportunities for student-centered projects like oral history? Do you wanna start us off, Mark? Sure, yeah, I can go ahead and I, I prepare for this question. Um, you know, when you said student-centered, for me, I was like, yes, it's student-centered and student-led, but like really what spoke to me that it was student-empowered, right? Like without students being able to work on it, this would have not happened, right? Because we know that um, from a professional staff perspective, we have full-time jobs, right? And we won't be able to dedicate um, time and effort and commitment, right? To be able to produce such um, uh, powerful stories, uh, which you all did. Um, when I think of, of, you know, Sergio mentioned uh, that a little bit earlier, but we, we, we hear stories from typically, right, like cisgender heterosexual folks, right, like um, sometimes misinterpreted, sometimes um, pathologized, right, like it's always like with a, a sad story, right, of of coming out and being disowned, et cetera, et cetera, right, and this one, I think for me, you know, when students came in and asked questions from like a really raw and authentic place, uh, it really brought out like the stories that we were hoping to find, right, that the stories of of um, being able to find community, being able to come out to certain folks, if not, you know, family and whatnot. And I think that's that's really powerful because if if professional staff were to be able to um, interview other folks, right, there would be this, uh, I think, this layer of like professionalism and bur- bureaucracy as well that, you know, would maybe not translate if a, if a student were to um, interview you know, another person, an alumni or an alumnex, right? Um, so I think that th- there's there's really like rich, um, like power and impact with students doing that themselves. And, you know, at the, at the baseline, what created leadership opportunities, employment for our students, it's really rare that, you know, queer students get to work on queer content, right? Uh, and being able to work on content that is related to your own personal and social identities is something else I think that, you know, people are trying to seek and find and, and we're able to find here at least with the Oral History Project. Thank you. Adras, do you want to share a little bit about creating student-centered opportunities? Sure. Uh, I think from the very beginning, we realized that not only did we need students to work on the project, but that actually that was the core sort of mission of the project is for this to be a student-centered project. And I think, you know, that obviously comes from the history of the center and students really being at the core of of the center's history and the queer community on campus, right? And so, you know, as Mark mentioned, we, we had many conversations about, you know, who would be doing interviewing and what the benefits and pros and cons would be to have staff versus students. And ultimately we landed at a place where um, we didn't really want the power dynamics to be in such a way where it, folks didn't feel that rapport and didn't feel that connection by having someone that perhaps does not have that 
that immediate connection with the center and the queer community on campus. And so that was really sort of instrumental in the way that we built this project, right, is having students be at the core of the project, but also lead the project in, in, in the direction that they, that they really saw fit. And I think, you know, <clears throat> for me as a, as a librarian, I think it's, it's really important to, to create opportunities for, for student-led research projects. And, and I always treat, you know, all of my students as, as researchers in their own right. And I think, you know, it's really important to empower them to pursue their own research interests. And, and so there was, there was very, you know, little, little to no, you know, censoring or editing or anything in, in regards to the questions that were asked and the topics that were covered. We really just tried to prepare students for what they might encounter in, in this field work, but really didn't, didn't hamstring them creatively in any kind of way to pursue whatever kind of topics or stories that they, that they thought were important. Um, Mark touched a little bit on sort of the professional sort of growth and skills that students might might develop. And I think that was also something that was at the fore for us. I think, um, you know, we really wanted to lay the groundwork for students to be able to, to, to take on this work, but really it was the students who sort of took that charge after a while and sort of built this project and, and learned new skills and techniques and, and project management skills and also opportunities to present professionally. And so I think that was also really important is, is you know, I've been a part of, of uh, oral history and community archiving projects, uh, both as a student, a uh, community member, and, and now professionally. And, you know, there's always this question of labor and, and I think it's important and it was important for us from the very beginning to not just see the students as laborers, right, but as as parts, you know, of this community and also folks who were really interested in, in, in bringing these voices out and celebrating this history. So I think that was also really important for us. And I think, you know, in terms of, of the community aspect of it, I think, you know, for me, I think you know, field work is is very important, and working in the community is is a very important part of pedagogy and of one's academic growth, right? And and I think you know this field work and engaging with these stories and 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 everything uh, really uh, made the students feel sort of a part of a larger community, right? Outside of just the bounds of Ann Arbor and the Spectrum Center, which I think was something that I was really really happy about. <coughs> Pardon. Um, and I think, you know, also, I think it's important, it, it was important for us to, to have the students understand that, uh, you know, the Spectrum Center and the community that, that has been built here in Ann Arbor uh, is really because of student um, work, right, because of student activism, because of, of, of sacrifices the students have made. Um, and I think that was also a really important part is to sort of have the students think about, you know, how they see themselves in the future as part of this larger community, right? Whether that, whether that be, you know, as activists or those fighting for some sort of social change. And so I think that was also an important part for us as, as well. Thank you. Um, question for Mark or address, but I'll start with Mark too. Um, what about working on this project or other projects that were student-centered has been the most rewarding for you? And is there anything really salient you can think of that you learned from the students that you worked with on this project? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so just for background, I've been you know, with the project since its inception in summer of 2019, and I just recently uh, left in July of this year. So it was it was a complete two years, right? And um, having one in the Spectrum Center, um, you know, a, a job that I really like doing and people I really like working with, um, you know, you, you get to know what you're doing, right? And I, like after five years, it, it gets in a routine way where, you know, you want some kind of excitement. Um, and in working with our students, which by the way, I, I've never really shared that out loud, but it's been an honor really to work with all the students on the project. Uh, Y'all have been stellar and I really, you know, it's been more of an honor for me that I hope it has been for you. Um, but, but coming back to my point, you know, seeing the passion that they had in working with um, other uh, possibility models, right, like role models potentially, uh, that had gone through their shoes, right, because we, we interviewed only uh, alums from the university, right, um, kind of like revived the passion of me working with LGBTQ students, right, working with LGBTQ individuals and groups and communities, uh, because, you know, I, I got in this, I think, uh, routine in which I was like, doing the things I did, 
but didn't realize like why I got into this job, why I got to work in the LGBTQ center, right? And that's because I was passionate in working and serving LGBTQ communities because those are communities of my own, right? Um, and and the, seeing the students kind of like having the glimmer in their eyes in terms of like talking about their, their former interviews or their interviews that they're gonna be conducting, uh, that was something that for me was like really uh, rejuvenating, I would say. Thank you. Um, Adras, did you have anything you wanted to share with that question? Yes, briefly. I think, you know, for me, you know, having mentioned that I've, I've worked on these, uh, you know, several of these types of projects in, in, in different communities, it, you know, I think this is the first time that I've been sort of a part of a project where it has truly been led by students in many ways. And I think, uh, that has been generally rewarding to see that it actually can 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 work and produce an, an amazing collection of stories and celebrate a rich history and um, highlight you know marginalized voices. Um, so that's been really rewarding for me. Um, and, and also too, I think you know one of the things that I really learned from the students is is you know in this work, uh, working in these communities that have often been, you know, that have been marginalized and brutalized and always, you know, keeping in mind um, how to deal with trauma and <clears throat> how to work in these communities without uh, creating like further harm, right? I think the students really showed a lot of empathy and care for each other and also for the community members and the interviewees. And I think that was probably the most rewarding thing is actually seeing the students show this empathy and flexibility. And especially since, you know, we had students who uh, were on for just a brief period of time, students who were on for multiple years. Um, it's really been uh, great to see how students treat each other and how they treat uh, the larger community. And I think um, that flexibility and, and care really shows in, in sort of the work that we were able to do over a span of, of three years. Thank you. All right, this next question is focused on the students. Um, so for students that were working on this project, what were some of your most memorable moments? I'll go ahead and let Leo start and then I'll chime in a bit as well. Erica, you go first for this one. You haven't gone first. Yet. Okay. <laughs> Well, I introduced myself saying I would go last, but I'll go first. Um, one of the biggest moments I think for myself was getting to interview Jim Toy and having that be my first interview. Um, most of the interviews that we conducted, we had interviewees come onto campus or we met with them on campus in some way. But to meet with Jim Toy, we went to his apartment and this was Mark and I, and then also some um, professional staff from the Office of Academic Innovation. And his entire apartment was covered in books on every single wall um, that was organized by his librarian friends who we also got to interview on the project. He had a poster of Richard Nixon hanging with like makeup over it. And it said, let me make one thing perfectly queer. And um, just getting to hear his stories in his own space where there's just so much history in there. He has papers all over the place. Um, it was, I still think about it and get chills. Um, I, I feel so lucky that I got to do that and have that opportunity um, and have that moment with him in his own space as well. Um, but I'm also thinking with our students, we got to go to Chicago right before the pandemic happened. This is spring break of 2020. Um, and that was just a beautiful moment for us to connect as students, connect as friends, um, explore the city together. Um, I don't know. It was just, it was fun going out and having dinner together and being in town. And um, it was a good time. I'll let Leo share some more. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, yes, I think that for me, the most memorable moments of this project have really been getting to work with the team. Um, I remember when I first started on the project, hearing the interviews and interviewing folks and hearing all of these awesome stories about all of these like queer parties that happened in the queer community. And I remember like hearing those and being like, am I doing something wrong? Like I've never been to a queer party. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I really need to get on that. Um, and so I think that also like really inspired me to connect with my own community a little bit more. And that community happened to be the folks working on the project. Um, and so, you know, we had a lot of fun in Chicago doing interviews, but also just like hanging out in our hotel room afterward or hanging 
hanging out, exploring Chicago. Um, I recently, also just a few weeks ago, the team went to Madison to speak about the, the project at a conference. And that was really fun to get to spend time with those team members, especially because um, one of them who's in, in the room with you in person folks, um, I hadn't really gotten to meet in person yet. And so being able to just connect with folks um, I think another thing that was really memorable for me was getting to interview some of my friends. So we tried to like reach out to anyone who was an alumni at the university. It was a little hard to connect with some folks rather than others. There were some people that I just knew who happened to be interviewed for the project. And so getting to interview those folks was really memorable, um, whether they had classes with me or I knew them, like I knew Sergio through the Prince of Korea of Arts project, um, or they were mentors to me. I think we might have Mary in the audience today. Hello, Mary. Um, I think that it was really lovely getting to interview these folks who I knew already, but getting to hear pieces of their stories that I had never heard before. Um, so whether that was like stories of their childhood for folks that I've only known in adulthood or stories of queer life on campus that I wasn't necessarily a part of or activism that I maybe didn't know they were involved in are just really rich and beautiful personal stories that you don't necessarily get when you just sit next to somebody in class. Um, and so I think for me, that was another piece of working on the project that was really rewarding. So yeah, overall working with the team and getting to make queer friends on campus as a queer student, um, and then also getting to interview folks who I knew and get to know them a little better. Thank you. Um, so for the students and staff members who worked on the project, in what ways has working on this project shaped your personal and professional experiences? We can go ahead and start with Adras if you're ready. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think for me professionally, like I mentioned earlier, it's just kind of proving that this kind of project could be done in this type of way, like that this model uh, works uh, and that, you know, but I think, you know, for me, you know, how everyone responded to the pandemic was really, uh, was really amazing. And for me professionally, I've never seen that sort of resilience before that the students showed. I mean, it was, it was a very critical moment. I mean, we started this project in 2019 and sort of just as we were getting sort of our feet under ourselves and starting to, to make, you know, a lot of progress and really sort of building out the, the workflows and, and everything that we needed, all of a sudden you have, you know, a global pandemic and <clears throat> in-person interviewing became, became untenable. And then so, you know, uh, we really had to shift and find ways to keep the project moving. And also uh, while being, you know, uh, cognizant of the, the trauma that the pandemic and its effects was having on the folks that we wanted to interview and also on the team members themselves. So I think professionally speaking, that was probably sort of something that I'll always take away from this project and from, from the students as well. Thank you, Mark. Do you have anything you wanna share? Just real quick, I think I would add to that, um, that I didn't really realize the power of intergenerational conversations in the past for me and that, um, you know, I've been listening to more old histories now uh, from core perspective, especially because I feel like as somebody who was not born in the U.S., like I don't have much of uh, what queer history looks like in the U.S. and the country that I'm living in. Um, so it's been really, really empowering to learn like, oh, there's been a lot of things done prior to me coming here and prior to me existing in order for me to exist, right? So um, it, yeah, it's been really rewarding just to like hear from, um, you know, elders and um, storytellers, you know, what have you experienced being here? And, and as I'm hearing, and as I'm listening uh, to the oral histories from our alum here at the university, I'm thinking like, okay, what are the possibilities now? Um, because I think sometimes uh, stories or even like experiences get lost or translated differently through history. But hearing from first perspective like this, I'm able to implement what has been implemented potentially 10 years ago, 20 years ago, right? Uh, that might have lost the momentum uh, throughout history. Thank you. Um, Leo, would you want to share anything with the project? Yeah, um, I think that it's had, I'll, I'll, it will probably be a lot shorter. I think that a lot of what Adras touched on was also things that I was thinking about in terms of um, professional impacts, but I think also it's just been really useful as a student. I think so many experiences at the university are very semester by semester. And so I think being able to work on this project over three years has been really impactful on my, my skills as a student and also as a, I hate this phrase, a young professional person going into the working world soon. Um, 
I've gotten to get really like good at being on both sides of like conversations, whether that's like interviews or speaking at events like this. Um, I think that's something I've gotten a lot more comfortable with over time. I'm also working on my honors thesis right now where I'm planning to interview um, transgender college students at U of M about their experiences. And so I feel a lot more confident moving into that work. Um, usually, you know, your honors thesis is kind of your first big research project as an undergrad. I'm lucky in that it's my second. Um, and so I think for me, that's been something that has been really impactful is just the way that it has shaped my academic experience here. Um, and then I think personally, I kind of touched on before, but just the way that it kind of allowed me to introduce myself to the queer community here. Um, when I came to school here, I was already pretty like out and loud. Um, and so I wasn't, I didn't feel a strong sense of anxiety, but I don't think I realized until I worked on this project that I really wasn't connecting with the queer community around me in the way that I had hoped to. Um, and so I think that was something that impacted me personally was just the way I was able to then plug into that community around me. Um, whether that was, you know, in my hall where I lived or with the folks working on the project or folks in my school. Um, but I think that it's been really hugely impactful in ways that I can't even, I'm, I'm still not even sure how to articulate. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That makes sense, thank you. I'll share a little bit too, I think on a professional level, um, I have been impacted in so many ways by this project. This was my first opportunity to really supervise other people and uh, being a student supervising other students is very, interesting, but I, I think I learned a lot and um, appreciated feedback that I got from student staff and professional staff in that opportunity. Um, also, I, I think I ask better questions when I talk with people and the, the mindset you have to be in when you're interviewing is figuring out how to get a story from someone um, and not in a way that is hopefully not oppressive or exploitative or forceful or coercive, right? You're you're looking for natural ways to um, kind of put a story together with this other person in a conversation. And the work I currently do, I work um, in HIV prevention in Southeast Michigan and I see patients. Um, and so I'm seeing largely queer people in this medical setting um, and trying to find ways to make them feel comfortable and make them feel like they're in charge of their sexual health. And so um, the ways that I get to know my, my people now is I'm using skills I used when I was interviewing, right? I'm learning how to ask questions in ways that make people comfortable and uh, ways that we connect on our stories. And I've been so grateful to be able to um, connect with my patients in that way. And I know it, it comes from working on this project. So a couple more questions, but in about five minutes or so, we're going to be heading into our Q&A session. So if you have any questions, feel free to write them in person on those sticky notes or feel free to enter them into the Q&A chat virtually. Um, but this is a question for the future. So where is this project heading and how can someone go about starting a project like this? Adras, would you like to start us off? Yes, happy to. Uh... Well, if folks are interested in, in starting a project like this on, on, on the Ann Arbor campus, reach out to me directly. That's the first step. Uh, so the library does support uh, oral history projects and community archiving projects. Um, and so we have, uh, you know, um, librarians and uh, staff who help support um, the resources needed. Um, and so like, we have spaces for interviewing, we uh, offer consultations around equipment and um, technical skills. I routinely uh, offer workshops around uh, oral history and community archiving projects to sort of introduce folks to what, what it means to start a project like this and what services are around campus. And I think that's that's really been, uh, something that I've uh, tried to do since I've I've come to the university is to try to connect folks in this in this community that's already exists on campus, but is many times in in different ways kind of disjointed because it, you know the where they're situated. And so I think uh, making those connections and reaching out is the first step. I would say. Thank you, Leo. Would you like to share anything? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I can definitely speak a little bit as to where the project is headed. Um, so like we mentioned earlier in our timeline, we're currently in the launch phase of our project for celebrating the Spectrum Center's 50th anniversary. Um, and then at the end of this semester and moving into next semester, we're hoping to complete a fourth round of interviews. So if that's something that you're interested in participating in, um, we'll stick those links back up on the screen at the end. Um, but I think after that is the last year of this particular project. So that is not to say that this work is done forever, um, but that this work is done for now. 
Um, one of the things that we have worked really hard on throughout this project is creating a lot of very clear documentation about the work that we are doing um, in the hopes that if other students were interested in creating similar projects or in the future picking this project back up, that would be there and the, the groundwork would kind of be laid for them already. Um, so that's something that if you're interested in starting a project that is similar to this, we're also happy to share some of that documentation with you or share resources or talk a little bit about our process in terms of developing this project. We are always happy to share that knowledge. Um, so you can find my my email on the Spectrum Center website, um, but I think otherwise, if you're interested in starting a project like this, yes, email address. <laughs> that was the little note that I had written down also. Um, reach out to a librarian or a community partner that you know has been doing this kind of work and see how you can start integrating that work into your own practices. Thank you. And I have one more question before we get into our Q&As. Um, in what ways do you see oral history being related to social change? Um, Mari or Sergio, would one of you want to start us off with that? Okay. <laughs> Sergio, awesome. Um, yeah, so I think in all the work that has been centered around social change, I think that we first need to understand what the social component is, right? So we need to understand society and communities. Um, most of the people that get left out are the ones that are not getting asked these questions. So it's the ethnically diverse folks, it's the queer folks, it's the trans folks. These are the folks that are getting left out and these are getting left out in policy and law and the major things that affect us all. Right, so we need to understand the social. And I think that oral history does a really good job at thinking about the social, at least those of us that work with these sort of marginalized communities. The change comes after. It's, I mean, for those of us that do oral history, I never see myself as somebody who's like capturing stories and also doing this type of groundwork, trying to create these, these huge changes. but I'm, I'm sort of the bridge, right? The bridge between one and the other. I have done my part to getting to know the community, to getting to highlight these stories. Now, who can I work with that has this extra power to take these stories to, to actually implement change? Because it doesn't stop with recording and it doesn't stop with interviewing, right? It also means how, do I, how am I facilitating these narratives so that they're not kept just in an archive, so that they're not just you know, collecting dust, but how do we take them um, strategically somewhere else and then actually implement change? So for me, yeah, I think that oral history is like extremely important at capturing the types of experiences that communities go. But as oral historians, it is our duty also to take it to those people that might be able to influence those folks positively. So that's how I see it. Thank you. Mari, did you want to answer this question at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, um, mm -hmm. I think it is about leveraging our, particularly as people who have a connection to vast amounts of resources, to, to access to platforms, right? It's about creating sort of empowering opportunities for people to be able to lead and tell their stories, you know? And, and I think that, you know, thinking about that foundational questions about where, for, for me, why is it important that this story be told um, and that, for communities who tell their own stories, they may have completely different priorities, completely different interests that don't that don't serve these institutions, right? And I think that us being able to sort of decenter ourselves and center the margins in the way we still tell stories is really important um, because people want to tell their stories, you know. And and particularly as the University of Michigan, we have a lot of resources and access that are really important to, to leverage and give communities access to so they can do what they need to do for them. Um, so yeah, that would probably be my only thing to add. Thank you. Yes, I agree with taking the resources we have access to, figuring out how we can distribute these better. So now we are going to go ahead and get into our Q&A portion. Um, so if you have any questions virtually or in person, please send those over um, either on Zoom or write them out on the sticky notes and we will go ahead and start tackling them. For the folks on the panel, while we are waiting, um, did any other responses that you heard from other panel members bring up any points or ideas that 
you wanted to piggyback off of or share anything like that? We just got a message from um, a participant, Danny, saying, giving autonomy back to those who are telling their stories. Thank you. I guess I can jump in with a comment uh, until we get a, a question coming through. Uh, <clears throat> so the question that you that you just asked about social change and, and what community means. And um, I think it's, you know, during this project, you know, I've always tried to, to work with the students to help them think about ways in which uh, the interview itself can serve as sort of a way to inspire folks to, for change, right? So like in many of the projects that I've been working on, it's been really important that we understand oral history is not just capturing what has already happened or perhaps what is happening in that particular moment right where the interview is is being recorded but also to ask questions about folks aspirations and where they see themselves and also but where where they see the community going so we actively tried to ask questions like usually towards the end of the interview about what folks aspirations are where they see the community in the future and oftentimes that leads to folks sharing you know their particular interests in in certain in enacting social change in certain kind of ways and i think that that's been really important is that we're not just capturing history but we're also capturing the hopes and aspirations of a community and of individuals right and so like those individual voices right create a mosaic that we can sort of get a clearer picture of what this community is all about and what their aspirations are and i think that can help right in in, in many ways for folks to understand um, queer community on campus and 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 what are their aspirations and goals and so i think we were very intentional with the questions that we asked as well thank you so we got a question from the audience. Uh, I think this would probably be best for Mark or Leo. Can either of you give a sense of the range of demographics of the people that we've interviewed so far, um, in particular to maybe age and generation, but identities, other things like that? I can hop in here and then Mark, if you have anything to add, you can go ahead. Um, yeah, for sure. So I think that overall, it tends to range across a wide um, demographic of people. I think one thing we noticed in our first round, um, our first round of interviews, you really intentionally targeted some folks who were like stakeholders on the university who maybe had a large role in social movements. Um, and what we found was that in that first batch of folks, we had a lot of folks who were white and we had a lot of folks who were cisgender and we had a lot of folks who were men. Um, and so moving forward from that point, we kind of were more intentional about what stories we selected. Um, and so I think we have a really wide range of folks, you know, the youngest folks we interviewed were like people who had graduated that year. Um, I don't know how old the oldest folk was that we interviewed, but we had a pretty wide range there. Um, I think in terms of other demographics, I'm, I'm having trouble coming up with like the full like list of folks we've interviewed right now. Um, but we got a lot more like intentional about it as we went, I think, trying to select folks from different demographics. Um, there was something else that I was thinking about, and now I am forgetting. But Mark, if you want to add anything to you can go ahead. Yeah, one thing that I don't know if we've mentioned before or not, but we uh, intentionally have selected alum, like an alum community to be able to interview, right? So if, uh, let, and, and especially the ones who have undergraduate experiences at the university, not all of them, but most of them. Um, what I would add to that is that, you know, one of our uh, core mission was to be able to diversify the archives. And that's not solely based on race, ethnicity, but also on like different demographics as well. So, um, you know, as, as Leo mentioned, you know, the people who um, potentially had more um, agency or um, autonomy back then were cis white men, right? Cis white gay men. Um, and, and they're the ones who we've heard about and who uh, whom, have voices in the archives as well, but we want to diversify that more to be able to be representative across ages, across race, across disabilities, across other social identities that can, you can think of as well. Thank you. I'll go ahead, Sorry, Leo. Just that really quickly. I think one thing that was really exciting for me as a trans person working on the project was seeing like, as we went along, how many more trans and non-binary folks we had, not just interviewing, but like applying to be interviewed. Um, I think that trans folks specifically have done so much work within the queer community and we see especially trans people of color. Um, and so I felt really like, I don't know, I, I felt almost in awe a lot of the time when we were interviewing folks who had done so much work for the community, but maybe didn't have as much um, representation in the archives or inclusion in those stories of how our community was built. And so I think that's something for me that like moving forward in the project is just really like, heartwarming and wonderful to see was like not only you know these are the stories represented in the archives but like these are my stories represented in the archives and getting to kind of connect with those as well so 
Thank you. Um, and this feels like this tie, this next question ties into what you just shared, Leo. Uh, at what point in the project um, did we think, wow, this is really something cool and significant that we're doing here? Um, I'll go ahead and start if that's okay. So in our first round, we interviewed Scott Dennis, who is a U of M alum and a librarian. And he was a teenager um, around the time that Jim Toy first started the Spectrum Center at U of M. So he was on campus as a 17 year old and connecting um, with the community before he was even a student there. But something that he shared is that he was going to U of M um, during the AIDS crisis in the 80s. And so hearing his stories and the the people that he loved and lost and um, got to sh share space with um, before their passing, unfortunately, really felt like we're capturing something that we don't always talk about. I think that um, we see HIV and AIDS, um, you know, in media and things and, and it's shared, but to have this like really local experience and this first person perspective. And he, he has a story in, uh, specifically, and I can't remember the name of his friend, but he had a friend that basically told off some bullies with him um, while they were out and about on campus together. And that friend later passed from HIV. And just hearing that story and hearing him talk about how it's not something that's always covered um, was really, really special. Um, and Scott has had experience with oral histories as well. And I remember him saying to me at one point when he was interviewed, someone said, you know, we don't have a lot of folks kind of around your age range um, in our project. And, and that's really, you know, we're so great. It's so great we can interview you. But why is it that we don't really have these stories? And Scott was like, are you kidding me? Like, they're dead. That's why you haven't gotten these stories is that we've lost so many people. Um, and I think it's something that we recognize, but it's not something that we always see of why aren't there as many queer people around. It's, it, you know, this, this crisis took out so many people in that time. Um, Leo, do you have anything you'd want to share about, you know, a moment for you of like, wow, we're really doing something cool here? <laughs> Yeah, um, not nearly as I think impactful as that, but I think for me, a lot of it was just these last few months, specifically hearing Adras talking about the project. Um, I think for me, it was when Adras was talking about sharing this work and sharing this work with um, the library and how excited the library was to hear about this um, and talking to our communications director, EJ, and they were talking about like, how are we going to like market these events? Can I get some graphics? Like, let's connect you with the press. I was like, wait, 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 what is going on here? Um, and so I think for me, like working in the project itself, I was like, this is pretty cool. I'm really excited to be doing this. But I think just like working on this launch specifically um, has helped me realize what the impact of this project could be, not only in terms of like distributing these stories, but also in terms of gathering more stories, um, empowering people to gather stories in their own communities. I think was the, yeah, that was the moment that I think really made it all stand out for me um, as being as big as it was. Thank you. Um, I also got a message that Scott is in the audience. So hi, Scott. <laughs> um, also, Adras, could you send your contact information into the chat? Somebody asked how can we contact you for access to the archives? Um, so I guess that would be a question for you. But also, could someone drop the website to, um, to share the stories as well? So the stories are currently accessible online. It's not something you have to go in person to the library for. So I think Leo's on sharing that right now. Um, another question we have here from our interviews, what is a takeaway that we hope is conveyed to people who might listen to these 50 years from now? Mark, would you like to share anything about that? Yeah, I think there for me, there's an academic component and a non-academic perspective as well. So academically, right, like we want to be able to to share the stories in, in any kind of like academic department, right? I know that women gender studies uh, and his, the history department are probably going to be really excited about those new perspectives, uh, you know, being added to the archives. But really for me, when, when I think of, you know, what kind of impact it might have in the future is that you know, um, I, I would hope that it's a continuous process, right? I know that next year is going to be the last year uh, for, for the time being, right? But when we get new student, a new wave of student, new, new wave of staff, a uh, new wave of volunteers, potentially, like, can we continue telling those stories, right? And maybe making that maybe like a longitudinal like project, right? And, and not just something over a three-year span. Uh, for me, it will be really impactful, right? When when I see myself potentially, right, like later in life and coming back and saying and, and listening to the stories again and being like, oh, 
like we actually work on this project and this is the kind of impact that we've had right like not just on ourselves but on our communities as well um is so, so for me it's really impactful right when i think of, of tra tra tragedy like uh the pulse shooting for example right like we've lost so many stories and so many humans there right uh and and people do pass away eventually right so when they do um you know do we get to carry on the legacy and the stories right like past that that moment of death as well thank you leo did you have anything you wanted to share what you hope is conveyed 50 years from now um so i don't know if i have anything specifically for that but mark you saying that just now i just had like a very emotional moment thinking about mm -hmm. myself 50 years from now like in my early 70s getting to listen to these stories again um, and hear myself like in college and I'll probably like laugh at myself a little bit and be like, oh my God, I was so pretentious and stupid at the same time. Um, but I think that, yeah, I think it's so beautiful that we're able to hold on to these stories for a long time, not just to share with other people, but I think really personally for myself, getting to record my start in this work is really, I don't know, I'm feeling really emotional about it in a way that I don't think I realized was happening before. Yeah. I'll share even for myself. Um, I was interviewed last fall of 2020. Maybe it was winter 2021, but um, in that time, you know, I graduated. I moved into my first apartment, had my first job after undergrad, um, and so I I put that interview on lock for quite a while because I want to apply to grad school in the next few years and <laughs> get some other things going. But I'm really excited to listen to it at some point, and just because this time has been so salient with everything that's been going on, how much change has happened. Um, I'm excited to personally listen to my own interview at that point. All right, we have another question. Um, in what ways has the project adapted or grown from its original intention as you kind of gain more confidence in the project, as you were doing kind of more um, introspection with it? Leo or Mark, I feel like you you two might have something with this. Yeah, I can start us off here. I think for me, the way that we were able to shift online um, really expanded my idea of what this project could look like. So when we started out, we, um, like Erica mentioned, we're only really doing folks locally. And then we were able to travel to Chicago at that um, spring break. But when we moved online for COVID, I don't think that I fully like realized at the time how much more accessible that made this project. Um, like Sergio mentioned before, he lives like really close to the border. And so it was really cool to like get that experience, it was really cool to get experiences from folks living in Northern California and folks living in New York City. Um, we had folks all around the country that we were able to Zoom call in and interview for this project. And I think that those experiences post-grad are so different, right? Staying in Southeast Michigan versus like leaving or being from other places. And so I think for me, that was like one way my idea of the project really expanded. Um, and it's something that like I plan to use moving forward. So I mentioned I'm working on my honors thesis and I'm only interviewing U of M students, but I'm doing all of those virtually. Um, it's really made the work that we do more accessible in a lot of really awesome ways. And I think that it's something that just oral history in general moving forward will really benefit from. And to add to what Leo mentioned, I think that uh, with the technology that we have nowadays, uh, it is accessible to a lot of people to right, start podcasts, you know, uh, episodes, right, or even uh, engage in oral histories with a lot of intention as well. And speaking of intention, I think for me, you know, when I thought about starting the, the project, I was like, I'm going to have a pool of alum that, I, that we want to interview, right? Yes, we want it to be diverse and whatnot, but the impact that um, age diversity has had on the project, I think, has, has been really significant for me because the experience of somebody who graduated 30 years ago versus the experience of somebody who just graduated are vastly different, right? And they tell different stories. And even the climate on campus was different, you know, in the, uh, uh, throughout the timeline as well. So for me, the, the impact that age diversity has had on the project has been really uh, valued and meaningful. Thank you. Um, I just want to share something from the chat. Scott said, hi, Erica. Thank you so much for acknowledging those we've lost who have contributed so much. Um, another question for folks, are there any opportunities for queer professional staff to help with these kinds of projects or people who aren't necessarily alumni? So are there any volunteer opportunities or ways that folks can kind of help with this project if they cannot directly participate themselves? I would say to probably, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, well, 
hold on, I don't even work at the Spectrum Center anymore. But what I want, I want to add, right, is that we probably don't have the answer or the structure right now, but get in touch with the Spectrum Center um, to, you know, um, be able to express your interest and see where can we shape and form that uh, that direction to go to. Uh, I know that um, um, since I've been there and, and still now, the Spectrum Center is always very receptive to the community needs, right? Whether that's been student, team members, colleagues, staff, and whatnot. So get in touch with the Spectrum Center and express needs and see you know, where that would go. But again, very intuitive here. And Will just shared, um, you can reach us at spectrumcenter at umich.edu. So feel free to email folks and see how you can get involved. Um, we have another question that we were kind of uh, assuming would happen at some point. How did the pandemic change your approach to this project? What things surprised you about shifting to a virtual setting and how did it impact your work? Um, Leo or Adras, either of you are welcome to share. Leo, would you like to go first or? You can start this one off, Adras. Sure. So uh, as I've mentioned earlier, we were kind of just really getting going with the project. It felt like when, when the pandemic uh, hit and uh, we were at a, a place where we, we essentially had to pause our work in terms of, you know, field work and interviewing um, just because, we, you know, for a few months there, you know, no one had any idea what, what was what was happening the next day or the day after that. And it was hard to plan around those sort of things. And, and me being from a, a having a traditional background in, in oral history, you know, it's, it's really uh, focused around uh, in-person interviewing, right? And sort of the performative aspects of oral history, right? That are often not talked about and, and the power dynamics that go into, you know, two folks sitting in a room together and one of them sharing stories and the other one trying to connect those stories with a, with a larger sort of narrative and a larger audience, hopefully. And so that was, it was really tough because we were trying to figure out a way in which we could move to the virtual space, but not also sacrifice a lot of the things that we had built and a lot of the things that we had valued in the way that we were interviewing folks in the community. Um, and so that shift was kind of like a crucial moment for us that was like, it was, it was really a test. Uh, uh, Mark and Leo and I went about, uh, you know, trying to figure out ways in which we could interview people and reached out to other oral historians through networks and connections and found out what other institutions were doing as they were shifting to, to the virtual space over the summer of 2020. Um, and we really took that whole summer to just kind of figure out what we wanted to do and what that pivot would, would mean for our work and, and also how we could keep the same, the same values and that that we had built on right we not wanting to 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 go away from that but also in in figuring out ways in which we could uh have these conversations on a really sort of personal level through uh distance uh interviewing which is tough to do in many ways but i think you know the the, the students really you know, amazed me in that way and how they were able to to be flexible and transition and learn new skills. And and we were for a while there, we were not even sure, you know, what the what the tools we were going to be using. And so we had to explore to see what tools would even work for us while also adhering to like institutional guidelines for preservation, metadata uh, and all those sort of things. And so that was a tricky uh, moment for us. And I'm just like, that's one of the proudest moments of the project is that seeing that we were um, at that moment where, you know, in-person interviewing was not going to be possible anymore and and turning that around into a, a, a net positive, right? Into being able to, to reach more people People in different uh, spaces, right, in different parts of, of the country, and getting different, more diverse stories in that way, while still not sacrificing sort of that, that those connections that you make with folks in the community as you're as you're interviewing or as you're you're conducting, you know, field work, even though it's it's through this virtual medium. Thank you, Adras. If it's okay with you, Leo, um, I'm going to go ahead and read. One more comment from our um, chat, and then we will go ahead and go into closing remarks. Um, Bruce, trying to get a last name. Um, Bruce shared with us, this has been great to hear from today's presenters as someone who was at U of M from 81 to 85 when what was known as a spectrum was the human sexuality office, when gay wasn't allowed to be in U of M offices descriptions and sexual orientation wasn't yet in any of the U of M statements of non-discrimination. It's great to reflect in spite of ongoing struggles and challenges encountered by queer folks, broadly speaking. Oh, how much has changed. Um, so thank you so much, Bruce, for that comment. And 
we will go ahead and have Will come back and close us out. Hi, this was so awesome. I was just uh, making some notes about how it's hard to hold it together. Um, uh, I, you know, I think it's really, it's really emotional, like Leo said, and I'm an emotional person. So then I decided I don't really need to hold it together. Um, no one's asking that of me. So I, so I won't. Um, this has just been really awesome. Um, I think it really represents like some of the best of our work. Um, the collaboration, the partnership, the impact, it's just really, really special. Um, I want to thank like the team of students that worked so hard, not just to put the project together, but the event today together. Uh, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Erica, for moderating the panel. Um, thank you to all of our panelists who shared their stories, your thoughts, your experiences. Um, I also want to thank all of those um, who both who are here today and who are not who participated as interviewees. Um, it's really, really um, so special that people gave uh, of themselves uh, to be a part of this project. Um, as many of you know, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary throughout this year, and this launch is a part of that celebration. Um, I invite you to dive into the stories of the Oral History Project, which, um, as was said, you can access through the Bentley Historical Library, and to, to connect these stories throughout campus. Um, they're meant to be shared. Right. There is so much power in in uh, using this tool in the classroom, uh, in co-curricular spaces and community spaces. Um, that's what it's here for. And that's I know what the team would love to see. Uh, so thank you um, to everyone who joined us for the launch. Uh, and we're looking forward to staying connected to you as we celebrate our 50th anniversary. So thank you so much. This was uh, an amazing way to spend the afternoon. Uh, I really appreciate it and um, hope you all will, will stay connected and that we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you.